Hi everyone. In just a few minutes, we'll get started with Our Enchanted Ocean, a night of art, performances, and science. We've still got quite a few people joining us, so thank you for your patience. Hi everyone, uh, stay with us for just another minute or so and we'll get started with Our Enchanted Ocean, a night of art, performances, and science. Thanks for your patience.
Welcome to the Ocean Encounters virtual series from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI, as we like to call it for short. Our Ocean Encounters online events are made possible in part by the Avatar Alliance Foundation and Dalio Philanthropies. My name is Veronique LaCapra, and I'll be your host for this evening. Tonight's event is Our Enchanted Ocean, a night of art, performances, and science. You just saw our first performance of the night that was shaman Harold E. Smith playing Good Vibrations from the Sea. High Tide Harold, as he's known, makes music with the goal, quote, of joyfully uniting our hearts with sacred sounds for sun, moon, and sea. In this case, playing seven giant conch shells. This particular music video was produced in collaboration with Hui's director of video production, Craig LaPlante. If you've joined us for previous Ocean Encounters, you've seen Craig in action without knowing it. He's behind the scenes of every event, running the visuals and making us, all of us on screen, look good. Tonight, we'll be treated to an eclectic evening of music, dance, poetry and film at the intersection of art and science. We'll have performers joining us from across the U.S. and even as far away as France, many of them live on Zoom. So I think we should be ready to expect the unexpected. All of tonight's performances share the common theme of the ocean in, its, in all its many facets. Our goal for this evening is to highlight how the ocean inspires creative expression in all its many forms. And it wouldn't be hooey if we didn't get some science in the mix, so we'll be doing that too. Towards the end of our program, we'll also announce the grand prize winners from Hui's 2020 Ocean in Focus Photography Contest. Their photos are definitely worth seeing, so stick around for that. Before we get to our performers, I'd just like to share some quick tips on how you can optimize your experience on Zoom with us. At various points throughout the evening, we'll take some brief intermissions between performances to take questions from all of you. If you'd like to participate in the live Q&A, please use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and type your question in the window that appears. You might be more familiar with the chat function in Zoom, but for tonight, please use the Q&A button instead. You can ask questions anytime starting now. I also want to let you know that we are recording this event. That recording will be made available on the hui.edu website after the event. All right, let's get this show on the road. Our next performance is by Boston Dance Theater, and we will be taking questions after the performance. So go ahead and submit yours using that uh, Zoom Q&A button while you're watching the dancers. Now I'm gonna turn things over to Boston Dance Theater's founder and co-director, Jessie Jean Stinnett, to introduce herself, the dance company, and this very special performance. Hi, Thank Jessie. You. Thank you, Veronique. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessie. Thank you so much for being here. As Veronique mentioned, I am the founder and co-artistic director of Boston Dance Theater. We are a Boston-based contemporary repertory dance company. We have a commitment to expanding the scope of contemporary dance performance practice within our city. And part of that effort is our current art and science project, Surge, which we are thrilled to share with you this evening. Surge is an ongoing collaboration between Boston Dance Theater and ocean researcher, Dr. Larry J. Pratt, who is a senior researcher at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Surge addresses the current climate crisis through the lens of sea level rise and also the role that art and science collaboration can play in creating a sustainable future. Tonight, we're gonna to share with you just a very short excerpt of what will be a full length evening performance, which we hope we'll have the opportunity to premiere in the summer of 2021. I just wanna thank Woods Hole for the opportunity to share this work and also to invite viewers at home if you wish to learn more about our current programming, which is supported by the generosity of individual donors, please visit our website, which is www.bostondancetheater.com. And at this point, I'd love to welcome the performers into the space and I will step away and hope that you enjoy the performance. Thank you.
I stepped onto the canoe and learned it is possible to live with the earth rather than purely residing on its surface. His bones were soft and cartilaginous until his body made contact with salt and water. A calcification cycle was closed, abandoned forever, the sweet placental liquids of his creators. That sea is warming and rising. The hurricanes are getting wetter and more intense. That along with a lack of maintenance, climate change is pushing houses, buildings, seawall. Six inches of sea level rise in the past 15 years has increased st storm surges and tainted my drinking water. And my parents used to laugh when they heard Boston is the fifth most vulnerable coastal city to flooding from sea level rise in the United States. Isn't it interesting? how the same water that floats you could be the same water that drowns you. Strolling along the roads, my field of vision of the sea was restricted as a result of my meager height at five years old. However, the picture of the seascape magnified with each and every step. When we were two blocks away from the waterfront, the color of the vast sea began to differentiate from the deep blue that could be perceived from afar into different shades and hues of azure and viridian. inaugurated where main land ends, transmuting his feet into genuine fins, a blue depth seduced by courage, respect, a marine tale taught by multicolor scales. The city of Boston is no longer the same. Even the simple things like drinking and cooking with clean water is no longer simple. The neighborhoods that raised me, Dorchester and Roxbury, filled with people who look like me, rely on that water. In a small town, Santa Cruz del Norte, in the north side of the island Cuba, I was born. The balcony of the fourth floor of my building was looking straight forward to the ocean, like two blocks away. I used to spend time walking in the rough and pointing 
rocks of the coast, gazing beyond that beauty, visible, look on water. The urban areas along the coast where 80% of the population resided was now replaced by rising briny waters. My family and friends were forced out of our home and country. The degradation of the land, soil, fauna, flora, society, and culture has turned this place that we used to call a home into a lifeless wasteland. The surface of the viscous waters fluxed and flowed as if it were Some people read the sea and intricately It's predicted that composed in their relationships I'm starting with the fact that about 20% of Cuban land symphonic Perhaps the sea to the stars well, become submerged The city of Boston is no longer the same Havana star from the Malecón Habanero Even the simple things The city iconic sea will deep reflection Like drinking Will rise And then crumble within myself Most of Boulevard Who face a building It's no longer of the ocean Thank you, dancers of the Boston Dance Theater, for that beautiful interpretation of sea level rise through movement and word. Joining Jesse Stinnett and me to talk about the performance is Huey Senior Scientist and Physical Oceanographer, Dr. Larry J. Pratt. His research focuses on the physics of climate and deep ocean currents. But he's here tonight because he was a science and production collaborator with Jesse and the Boston Dance Theater on this project about sea level rise. Larry and Jesse, thank you for joining us. We have a few questions from the audience for you. Um, Larry, let's start with you. Uh, are you a dancer yourself? Um, well, first of all, thanks everyone for. Um for tuning in. Um, actually, um, 10 years ago, I knew nothing about dance. And uh, since then, I've, I've taken um, a bunch of classes and for fun. And um, uh, one of the things about taking dance classes is that um, it does help you kind of speak the same language um, as the dancers and the choreographers speak. Um, but you wouldn't want to pay to see me dance. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit more about how you made the connection as a scientist. And you talked about sort of the language of uh, dance being different from, from that of, of science. Um, how did you make that connection from your scientific research to dance and, and to this particular project with the Boston Dance Theater? Well, I'm, I'm interested in uh, the physics of ocean circulation. And, um, you know, there's a lot of um, real beauty and mystery there and in, in, um, in terms of, um, well, looking at things like waves and meandering currents and turbulence. So there's a, there's a natural connection right there with the dynamics of, um, of dance. And um, as far as the project with uh, Boston Dance Theater goes, I've I've known Jesse for a while. We met at a dance workshop. Um, we had been talking about collaborating on something for, for a few years. And uh, the sea level rise was actually her idea. And she went out and got a grant funded to um, get things started. And I've been functioning as a science consultant um, 
also been doing some other things. Um, one of the one of the problems that arose right from the beginning, which was last spring, was was that the, uh, there was the uh, pandemic. There were some um, live performances that were canceled. There was a residency that was canceled, and so Jesse and I um, brainstormed a little bit about uh, maybe making a dance video and doing it outdoors, where we could, you know, everyone could space out. I knew of a place on the Cape where the um, where the tide comes in rapidly. Um, it's out near Wellfleet. And um, if you go there at low tide and watch the tide come in, you can see sandbars and islands and you um, kind of disappear right before your eyes. So it's a, it's a great place to make a video on sea level rise. And um, so that's what we did. We shot it last July and, you know, I helped scout the area and help with, you know, figuring out the tides and, and lots of other little things like that. Neat. Jesse, uh, do you want to kind of give us your point of view sort of in the other direction? How, how does, how do you see dance as connecting with science? Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, to add or to augment what Larry was saying in that, um, you know, his role has been supportive of us in our work in so many different ways. And I think that by having the ability of uh, bringing Larry into the studio with us right away from the beginning of this creation process, it really allowed for me and also my co-collaborators, because we really do work collaboratively uh, in creation process here in Boston Dance Theater, it allowed us to sort of reimagine or deconstruct some of our more traditional uh, ways of creating. And that sort of ability to really look to the science for, for different perspectives has carried through all the way to now when we're thinking about presenting the work. So, it, you know, it's, I think the interaction with the science has allowed us to really open up some bigger questions about what, what are we doing? Like, how are we making our work? What are we really making it about? And, and where do we see this work fitting into the field? So it's, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, that Larry's presence has, has been very helpful and also uh, has carried us along through all of the stages from creation to performance to imagining production. That's neat. Um, Jesse, it sounds like uh, just from the, from the performance that uh, many of your dancers are originally from islands. And I, I know one is from the island of Cape Verde um, as you may know, we actually have quite a few Cape Verdeans uh, living here on, on Cape Cod, where Hui is. Um, Hanok Spinola, would you mind coming forward up to the camera and telling us a little bit about your personal connection to sea level rise? Absolutely. Um, well, so as we, as already mentioned, I am from Cabo Verde, otherwise known as uh, Cape Verde, but I am based here in Boston. Um, I cannot say that I've been directly or directly experienced the effects of sea level rise, but I can say that I have treasured memories of living in Cap Verde and being within the rich culture there and its profoundly deep connection with the ocean. But something that's concerning is that the way of life, the uh, society and the heritage surrounding Cabo Verde is at risk of being completely uh, disrupted by sea level rise, coupled with droughts, flooding, and coastal erosion. Um, in a sense, it's um, it's a, I see it as being problematic because my point of origin is also at risk of being completely inhospitable. And that is a fate that is shared among many other uh, small island nation states. Would any of the other dancers like to add anything? I don't want to put you on the spot, but just in case. Okay, no worries. Um, She's just asking if any of the other dancers want to speak. Just about your personal connection to the piece. And maybe the work. 
Um, Say your name, please. Uh, Taimi Miranda. So I come from Cuba. Um, part of the what I was speaking in, in the piece is about my story. Um, I I born like two blocks away from the coast, so I pretty much spend most of my time uh, connecting with it. I have experience. Uh, I, have an, I have some friends there that grew up in a neighborhood where it's like really close to the coast, like 10, 10, 20 feet away. And when I came back to my country two years ago, I was completely baffled by seeing the repercussion of so many hurricanes uh, passing through. And that neighborhood completely was like destroyed, basically. Um, one of the part that I speak about is about the Malecon Habanera, which is in Havana. And I also, it's, it has happening over the years that with the cold fronts and the hurricanes, you can see that how the water comes inside and trespass the seawall and people have to eat, get out of their houses or the buildings and just move for, for a while until that water, you know, drains out. So. I basically feel really connected with this project because I have seen that and I guess by seeing it, you can feel it. And yeah, I don't have so much to say about it, but yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question, uh, another question from the audience. Um, about uh, asking sort of about the piece itself and, and how long a piece like this would normally take to prepare? That's a great question. And I think it has a, a really special answer for us right now, because as Larry mentioned, um, we really started the creation process for this work. Uh, we started in January, but in March was when we were gonna be heading really full time into the creation process, and that's right when the lockdowns from the COVID-19 pandemic hit Boston. So this creation process was interrupted, and at the time it felt devastating to all of us. Um, we normally would start rehearsing in January and then have a, a, an hour length work finished and ready to perform by June. But um, I think I speak for myself and maybe for the others too, that I think that being forced to pause and to slow down and to have time to get into deep and sometimes challenging and sometimes emotional conversations as a cohort has allowed us to go into places that we never imagined. Like Larry mentioned, we created a film. We have been working through a virtual series of our own through Boston Dance Theater this fall. We're considering embedding the work within a particular community in Boston that's eminently going to be affected by sea level rise, like some of the other areas and, and peoples that, that the dancers have mentioned, um, have seen already, are already experiencing. So yeah, this work, I don't know when it's gonna end, honestly, because we keep we keep finding new meaning in every iteration that we're, we're diving into. So I kind of answered it, but also it's open, I think, for us. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but I just want to thank all of you, all the dancers, Jesse and Larry, for, for joining us for that very special performance. <laughs>
As Keith puts it, it's a sublime example of his impressionist style, characterized by an obsession with the play of light on water and the diffusiveness of color. This piece tells the story of an ancient Breton legend of a cathedral that on certain beautiful summer mornings rises from beneath the waves next to the island of Is and then sinks back from whence it came. You'll hear in this piece the beginning, the calmness of the top, stillness of the water um, at the beginning of the morning. And from the distance, from underneath the waves, you hear the peal of bells and the sound of monks chanting till the entire cathedral is revealed in all its glory and you hear the mighty cathedral organ and then the whole thing sinks back from whence it came. I thought this was perfect for Woods Hole because it speaks to mankind's eternal obsession with what lies beneath the waves, which of course is what Woods Hole Oceanographic is all about. Anyway, this is Debussy's Prelude, La Cathedrale Engloutie.
That was really lovely. Um, thank you to Keith for sharing that with us. Uh, you can really picture the whole underwater ballet unfolding uh, in those notes. It's incredible. Um, now we have something completely different. Uh, so get ready. Next, uh, we are delighted to welcome Victoria Bautista. Hi, Victoria. Hey, Veronique. Victoria. Thank you. <laughs> Victoria is a lawyer who works as a legislative analyst in Washington, D.C. She's all, she also happens to be a poet. She has competed in spoken word competitions at regional and national levels and has performed her work at two TEDx conferences. Victoria, it's great to have you with us tonight. It's so great to be here. Thank you so much for featuring me with all of this wonderful art. Um, I'm really excited to be here and excited to present this. This is an ocean poem. I know that you're tired of hearing poetry about oceans. So many are taken by the waves, dragged asunder by the vicious current, helpless people overcome. But can we talk about the real things living down in the deep blue sea? Because it is not the cutesy propaganda that Finding Nemo has led you to believe. There are millions of night terrors setting up shop, shop down below. Exhibit A, the mouth brooder, a type of cichlid. The female mouth brooder carries eggs in her mouth, while the male mouth brooder has genitals that look suspiciously like eggs. When a female mouth brooder catches sight of a seemingly free floating and vulnerable egg, she will immediately swim up to it to swallow it. It is at this point that the male mouth brooder will fertilize the eggs. Gross. Exhibit B. The frilled shark has three pointed teeth and probably a bad attitude. The gopher eel averages six feet long with a jaw that swings open to catch its prey. The goblin shark can detach its entire mouth from its body in order to catch a meal. I wish that I had pictures so that you can understand the gravity of existing creatures that can eat things that they have no business eating like hydrogen sulfide and volcanic ash. Exhibit C. Did you know that the ocean deep has sulfuric vents and volcanoes? That's right. The ocean floor has actively exploding volcanoes that spew hot lava and boiling sulfur into the water. It doesn't sound fun. Exhibit D. After about a thousand meters, light can no longer penetrate the surface water. Pressure skyrockets enough to flatten a car into non. Imagine gallons of water coming at you from all sides as you lose sight of the sky. Up and down become completely arbitrary in this time, in this twilight zone. This is the darkness that we fear. This nightmare of an environment. These are the things that are living down there. Somehow these things still live down there, even at its darkest depths. Life will persist. When the female mouth brooder's eggs hatch, she will die. But there are some sacrifices that we are always willing to make. Ocean mouths prove that these weird head holes that we have can be pretty darn powerful if we put them to the right uses. There are flatfish that survive atop of sulfuric vents gliding up and over underwater volcanoes. There are shrimp that have adapted to consume the deadly gases and survive the boiling hot temperatures that would otherwise cook them. Giant tube worms utilize chemosynthesis in order to get all the nutrients that they would need from sunlight but can't get at these depths in the vast and wild darkness. Deep sea creatures have learned how to make their own light. Bioluminescence is the result of repurposed deadly bacteria that creates a kaleidoscope colored scene. It is the most important method of communication on earth. Millions of twinkling lives refusing to simply quiet for the dark. I know that you're tired and scared, overwhelmed. The water is up to our necks and it is getting very hard to breathe in here, but you are not the type to crumble helplessly. We were built to adapt. We've got survival weaved into our bones. You will not be overtaken. You will not be overcome because you, you were built to swim. Thank you. I love that ending. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Victoria. That was great. I'm still a little bit stuck, though, on the fact that you're a Washington lawyer, um, and I know you're originally from Oklahoma. So how did you get inspired to create a spoken word piece about the ocean? And how do you just know so much about the ocean, just for one thing? 
I mean, uh, institutes like yours open up the, the beauty and the wonder of the ocean so much to people who don't necessarily have it as a day job. And so I, I can only be thankful to the research uh, that Huey has done and that, and that so many other scientists have done. When it comes to the ocean for me, uh, I moved to the Philippines when I was very young and from landlocked Oklahoma to an island, uh, you really easily and quickly learn the beauty uh, of, of such a, a, a large thing that covers 75% of this, of, of this planet. And so um, I think everybody should love the ocean. I don't see any uh, downsides to it, honestly. Well, and just to tell our audience, the, the images that you're seeing there are just some of the images that uh, Hui uh, has collected uh, over the years doing research. And, um, and Victoria, I'm really grateful for your work as well. We need all the ocean ambassadors that we can get. So thank you. Absolutely. And thanks for having me. Joining us now is Megan Lubetkin, the producer director of the short experimental film, Divergent Warmth. For those of you watching on Zoom, please feel free to submit questions using your Q&A button. Um, we will be taking questions after we see the film and we'll talk with Megan and also a Hui scientist who was involved in the film's production. Rung 
rung after rung, and still the oxygen immerses me, the blue light, the clear atoms of our human air. I go down, my flippers cripple me, I crawl like an insect down the ladder, and there is no one to tell me when the ocean will begin. First the air is blue, and then it is bluer, and then green, and then black. I am blacking out, and yet my mask is powerful. It pumps my blood with power. The sea is another story. The sea is not a question of power. To learn alone, to turn my body without force in the deep element. And now it is easy to forget what I came for among so many who have always lived here, swaying their crenellated fans between the reefs. Cast off since dive 5048 to be specific. Besides, you breathe differently down here. I came to explore the wreck. The words are purposes. The words are maps. I came to see the damage that was done and the treasures that prevail. I stroke the beam of my lamp slowly along the flank of something more permanent than fish or weed. The thing I came for. The wreck, and not the story of the wreck. The thing itself, and not the myth. The drowned face always staring toward the sun. The evidence of damage, worn by salt and sway, into this threadbare beauty. The ribs of the disaster, curving their assertion among the tentative haunters. This is the place. And I am here, the mermaid whose dark hair streams black, the merman in his armored body. Circle silently about the wreck. We dive into the hold. I am she. I am he. Whose drowned face sleeps with open eyes. Whose breasts still bear the stress. Whose silver, copper, vermeil cargo lies obscurely inside barrels, half wedged and left to rot. Destroyed instruments that once held to a course the water-eaten log, the fouled compass. I am, you are, by cowardice or courage, the one who find our way.
back to this scene, carrying a knife, a camera, a book of myths, in which our names do not appear. Thank you, Megan. I feel like every time I watch that, I see something new in it or notice something about the way the footage goes with the audio and the poem and the music. It's it's really neat. Um, joining us, uh, joining Megan and myself to talk about the film and to take your questions is Hui Emeritus Research Scholar and Geologist Dan Fornari who invited Megan to join him on that research expedition and acted as an associate producer for the film. Hi, Dan. Hi. Thanks very much, Ernie. Sure. Uh, Megan, first, thank you for joining us from Paris in the middle of the night for you. We appreciate it very much. Um, we uh, have a question for you from the audience um, about how long you've been a professional filmmaker and how this collaboration between you and Dan came about. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so I, I definitely would not consider myself a professional filmmaker, uh, really at all. Um, I'm, I'm an ocean scientist, so my background is in submarine volcanism and geochemistry. And I've known Dan for, um, three, four years now. And, um, yeah, so Dan invited me to come out on uh, a research cruise to the East Pacific Rise as a research uh, scientist assisting with with the mission. And the film was um, something that happened uh, not entirely intentionally, but through this expedition. Well, I'm glad it did. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. but. Dan, we're getting some questions uh, from the audience about the research you were actually out uh, doing on that cruise itself. We saw Alvin, who is iconic research sub in the film. Uh, where were you and what were you trying to learn? And Linda in particular wants to know what experiments were being conducted at the hydrothermal vent. Uh, so we were um, out there on the East Pacific Rise. Uh, it's an area that is about uh, 500 miles south of Acapulco, Mexico. It's in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific. And we're studying a place where the Earth's tectonic plates is spreading apart, a mid-ocean ridge system, um, at a depth of about 2,500 meters. That's where the summit area is, uh, where we had been looking at um, uh, a variety of uh, processes, both uh, volcanic, uh, hydrothermal, um, as, as well as um, uh, processes related to uh, geochemistry and the, um, uh, the sort of geochemical changes that take place uh, in, the, in the rocks that occur at these, uh, uh, at, at these sites. And it was done in collaboration with a number of scientists. Uh, in fact, the chief scientist was Jason Sylvan at, the, um, at Texas A&M University, Lauren Molyneux, also as Hui, a senior scientist. So we were uh, doing multidisciplinary science. Um, and uh, in my particular case, uh, the program that I'm involved in is a, a three-year funded program by the National Science Foundation to look at the um, uh, characteristics of the hydrothermal vents and the volcanic features and the run-up to the next eruption. This is an area that has actually erupted twice uh, in um, uh, the last uh, about 30 years. And we are now expecting another eruption to happen uh, sometime in the next few years. And, and we were successful in getting NSF to fund a program that would go out on a yearly basis and uh, monitor the hydrothermal vents, take fluids, uh, put temperature loggers that I've designed in them and, um, and, and uh, do uh, some detailed mapping with the Sentry vehicle. 
Neat. I love that photo. I think that's really cool. Um, Megan, so you were on the cruise to help Dan and others actually with the research that was going on. What inspired you to uh, make a film while you were out there? And and I'm curious why you chose that particular poem, which is uh, Diving into the Wreck by uh, feminist poet Adrian Rich. Um, yeah, so I... I was out on the cruise and we were diving with Alvin and Sentry for about three weeks. And then um, during our, our fairly long transit back to port, I was um, working through a lot of video data and processing a lot of, a lot of the data that we had collected. And I'd also been shooting with my, my own camera um, uh, above water. So we were working with a lot of camera systems underwater um, with Dan's gear, but Above water, I was also uh, capturing a lot of deck operations and, and movements that were happening on the ship. Um, just So all that underwater, I'm sorry to interrupt, but all that underwater footage was actually captured by Alvin on, on that cruise? Yeah, so, so it's pretty, um, Dan can speak more to this if he'd like, but the, the really exciting thing that we were able to work with was um, both Alvin and an elevator. So it's like a platform that you can put a lot of different instruments or cameras or lights on and lower it down to the seafloor. So it's not, it's not a vehicle, it's not moving on its own, but you just lower it kind of like an elevator. So um, we had the ability to capture video footage on Alvin and of Alvin using the elevator. And it was just an exciting experience to use many different cameras. And there's an example of it right there. Um, so I was I, wondering how you got the shots of Alvin. <laughs> yeah. Um, so at the end of the, the, the diving while we were in transit, I was looking at many, many hours of video and, um, editing that on, on some computers and editing my own, my own film on some other computers. And, um, I kind of thought it, a narrative could be created, uh, sort of a illustration of a day um, and the experience of, of these kinds of operations. So that's how the idea came about. Very cool. And why Adrian Rich? Oh, um, so I, I was listening to a lot of poetry at the time. And um, yeah, Adrian Rich is, a, is uh, somebody that I really admire her work uh, for many reasons. And, you know, the, the poem speaks to many things. It's, it's really more of a, an, an allegory or a metaphor, um, but in this in this piece, I was kind of diving deep into the illustration of of the poem, um, and I think you know there's something really uh, beautiful in the way that everybody comes together on the ship in the operational sense and in the scientific sense. Um, everybody is really playing an important role, but there's also something really uh, singular, I think, in the experience of of diving in Alvin and in, in pursuing science. Um, so kind of the, the combination of, of this quest that you're going through in the process, but also the, the community that is involved is, is um, partly how the illustration kind of came about. Yeah, I thought it really worked. Um, Dan, we have a question here from Richard. There's a little bit of a change of topic, but um, he's wondering how cruises have changed in the era of COVID and in particular how they've affected your own uh, research plans or maybe plans to go back out to sea. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I guess I will say that um, uh, certainly uh, uh, all science uh, and uh, certainly oceanographic science, which is very participatory and having to get on a ship and go out uh, oftentimes weeks from away from port, um, it has been quite affected, but the, the, the federal funding agencies and the ship operators and the US community, and in fact, internationally have been really quite cautious uh, and, and following um, uh, the lead of the science, if you will, uh, in terms of quarantining uh, and being quite careful about how they set these crews up, uh, cruises up. Um, and it, it, it involves, uh, extensive quarantining, only going to US, in and out of US ports. So some of the science has had to be delayed. Uh, it will happen eventually, um, but uh, uh, they're just being quite cautious because it's hard to go into foreign ports. Um, even if everybody on board is known to be COVID free, there's still uh, restrictions uh, internationally. 
Um, so it, it is happening, but it is quite a bit more difficult and, and, and really everybody is working hard to try to try to make it all work and, uh, you know, keep some of the, some of the oceanographic fleet uh, continuing to work and, and whatnot. I, I guess I just wanted to say that, you know, that, that, that question also to me is, is something that is, um, uh, it's, it, it, it's quite um, emblematic of the, of the movie that Megan put together because um, one of the things that I took away from how she presented the, the, the material, both the beauty of the material, but also the, the variety of the um, crew working on the ship and the, and the crew, the engineers working on the various vehicle systems, um, uh, you know, uh, like many things in life, uh, science requires uh, dedication and determination and collaboration. And, and I would say, you know, those should be guiding lights for us um, uh, in science and in life. And, and, and really, I think these times have quite challenged us uh, on all of those levels. Um, but I, th I think ultimately we'll be successful because, uh, you know, people want to continue the work and they want to continue to you know, be on this planet and to be successful. So I, I uh, the, the, the movie to me uh, always resonated when Megan first showed it to me at sea. Uh, you know, this is really what it's about in terms of doing science at sea and in terms of sort of life in general. It's a, it, it, it's a, it's a group effort. We need to uh, go on to our next performer, but Megan, I just want to quickly ask you, do, do you see yourself going on as a scientist or as a filmmaker or, or both? Do you, do you not see them as uh, conflicting paths, but rather something you could put together going forward? Um, it, in my life, uh, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not really sure. Um, at sea, I think I'll, I keep sailing as a scientist. So I think I'll probably keep doing that for a while. Um, and in general, I'm, I'm really interested in pursuing transdisciplinary projects. So we'll see where that goes. All right. Well, thank you again for joining us all the way from France. Um, you can go sleep now, I'm sure. Um, but merci beaucoup. And thank you also to Dan for joining us. Thank, thanks very much for putting this together. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks. All right. And now it's time to announce the grand prize winners of Hui's 2020 Ocean in Focus Photography Contest, which received more than 1,200 entries and 7,300 votes. Um, our uh, team grand prize winner, uh, we want to say congratulations to her. Her name is Yana Monterey from Huntington Beach, California. And her photo, which you're seeing there, is entitled Changing Tides. Yana writes about it. I was watching the sunset underneath the pier and I wanted to capture the sunset in a new way. The tide was moving in and out, so I thought I'd capture all of the motion in the water by zooming in and out while taking the photo. So that's the secret to that beautiful photo we're looking at right there. We also want to say congratulations to our adult grand prize winner, Nirupam Nigum from Ocean Shores, Washington, for the photo entitled, A Face Only a Mother Could Love. Uh, describing the photo, Nirupam writes, wolf eels live most of their adult lives, as many humans do, in the same den with a single monogamous partner. Each wolfie, as those eels are called, has an individual personality. And many of us Pacific Northwestern divers get to know them quite well over the years. This male eel is particularly friendly and will come out of its den to greet passing divers. I took this photo of my dive buddy, Joyce, taking a photo of our wolf eel friend. Congratulations to our winners. For our final performance of the evening, I would like to welcome Savannah, Georgia-based songwriter and multi-instrumentalist Zach Deputy. Zach describes his musical style as island-infused drum and bass gospel ninja soul. Welcome, Zach. Hi there. Um, tonight, you'll be performing a song called Wash in the Water, 
Uh, tell us a little bit about the story behind that song and what about um, whether the ocean played a part in inspiring you to write it. Um, well, I kind of a multi-generational grow up on an island. I'm a family person, so always stood near the ocean. And the ocean is like one of those things. It's like a system reboot. You know, you get there and... Uh, you might be having a bad day, but you get in and it just seems like once you get in the ocean, you swim around, you go wave surfing um, for a little while. Everything seems right with the world. So I always use it as an analogy that um, in my life, no matter what's going on, take a deep breath, wash it in the water. Everything's going to be OK. So it's pretty much a metaphor for anything that's bothering you, troubling you. Put it in the past. Live in the now move on i love it and with that here's zach deputy performing wash it in the water well i'm glad to be here with everybody stick my ears in so i can hear myself Na 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 na
one of the brown, we gonna make it all right. Come on, I'm a sucker, mama, we know one of the brown, we gonna make it all right. No, 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 Thanks, Zach. That was awesome. Uh, if somebody wanted to hear that song again, is there an album they could pick up? Yeah, um, uh, the album is called Washed in the Water, so <laughs> easy to remember. Great. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much for performing that for us tonight. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Much love. All right. Well, I hate to say it, but we're getting close to the end here. Uh, once again, I'd like to say a big, big thank you to all of our performers and to all of you in the audience for joining us tonight. What a great way to finish out Hui's Fall Ocean Encounters season. We're especially grateful to our sponsors, the Avatar Alliance Foundation and Dalio Philanthropies. And as always, I want to say a big thank you to my Hui colleagues who've been working really hard behind the scenes to make this and all of our Ocean Encounters events possible. As I mentioned, this was tonight was the last event of our fall season, but we will be back. If you want to learn more about future events and uh, stay up to date with Hui's latest ocean news, sign up for our e-newsletter. That's at hui.edu forward slash ocean insights. And if you enjoy these events and you'd like to support the work of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and all of our great scientists and engineers, you can do that with a gift at hui.edu forward slash give. To close out this very special evening, we have a short video called This Is Our Time. On behalf of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, enjoy the rest of your evening and see you soon. Out where the seas are the deepest and the mysteries the greatest lies our future. The ocean is our last unexplored, ungoverned frontier. The life support system for our planet, inextricably linked to our climate and weather and to the lives and livelihoods of countless people around the globe. But even against the ocean's vastness, humankind can be a formidable force. What happens next demands action that is rooted in scientific understanding and unvarnished truth, because our world stands at a fork in the road. In one direction, we watch the ocean being catastrophically altered beyond its ability to sustain us. In the other, understanding outraces exploitation and we help steward and protect this most precious shared resource. What will be the legacy of the 21st century? Here and now, the world's most impressive collection of minds passionately dedicated to ocean science, engineering, education, and policy has a role to play with the expertise to know what works and a trusted voice to present the facts as we uncover them, we can shape the future. We can inform governments, businesses, and conservationists. We can be the catalyst for change and unleash new knowledge in service of society. It is more than our responsibility. It is the defining moment of our generation. We our Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And this is our time.